So today uh, we are very honored uh, to have uh, Professor Jürgen Anders. Um, he's a professor of higher education management at the School of Management, University of Bath. His academic interest is focused on the study of institutional change in the fields of universities and their roles in the society and the economy. He is a member of the editorial board of the book series, Higher Education Dynamics and the journal Higher Education. He was written and co-edited 15 books and published more than 140 articles in books and journals, including organization studies, public management, public management review, studies in higher education, uh, higher education and uh, central metrics. Elsewhere in the University of Stanford released data has recently named him among the top 2% of most highly cited academics in the world in the social science. So today we are very honored to have uh, Professor Anders with us and he will share with us his insight on uh, organizational change in universities. Mm -hmm. So now I will turn to the uh, mic to the Professor Jürgen. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much for this very kind um, introduction. Thank you all um, for joining in. Um, I'm looking forward to this um, seminar and especially to the hopefully very lively discussion um, after my lecture. Um, I would like to thank the colleagues from Tampere, from Peking, uh, for inviting me, for arranging this so well, and, and for making time, a quite unusual amount of time for such a seminar so that we can hopefully really um, also exchange with each other um, on this topic. Um, so it really is about um, what I would call the institutional form of the university as an organization. And if, how, and to what extent we can observe changes, and I would argue deep changes um, in the institutional form of the university as an organization. And I have tried to, to find a metaphor for that. And I found this frog very appealing. Um, you may or may not be familiar with this little story about the boiling frog. You know, the story that when you put a frog into um, water and then you start some heat below, uh, that if you put the heat up very quickly and very high and the water becomes quickly very hot, the frog will jump out. But if you take more moderate temperatures and you heat the water up slowly, the frog will lo look like this one, very comfortable. Um, and while actually, the frog is quite in quite a fragile position, you could say, and it would be not a bad idea for the frog to eventually jump out of this glass of water. And for me, the organizational transformation and transformation here means deep change. Um, it's not just any change. Um, it's a mixed blessing for universities as organizations. Um, because they become, on the one hand, more important um, as actors within the organizational field, while they also, on the other hand, um, become more, how would I put that, become in danger to be deinstitutionalized. And if we have time, at the very end of this lecture, I will come back to that. And we will revisit this frog um, for a moment. So having said that, let me give you 
a quick overview on what I will try to talk you through. Um, so I will start with something um, that you may be very well, very familiar with, traditional notions and academic concepts that highlight universities as special organizations that sometimes wonder if universities are actually organizational actors at all. Um, I will do that very briefly because I know that previous lectures in the seminar series have already addressed this point. I will move on to look a bit at the, the field of higher education. So meaning the organizational population of universities themselves, but also other actors, last but not least political actors who populate this field and who in, from my point of view, um, play a major role in changing the institutional environment of universities to an extent that the institutional form of the university as an organization changes as well. And then I will talk you through three different while interrelated um, perspectives on, so what is happening to our universities? Um, it's a mix of conceptual work and empirical work. Um, also trying to make a theoretical contribution um, to our understanding of how we can look at the university as an organization within its institutional environment. That's importantly what it will be about. And the first perspective, and I will work that out during the lecture, you know, speaks to issues around hierarchy, rationality, and identity of universities. The second one will address the issue of organizational control. Um, and the third one will address the issue of organizational autonomy that has for a while been quite popular, at least in political discourses um, in Europe. And that leads me to say that really my focus is a European perspective. Um, I do not claim that what I'm talking about will be meaningful necessarily, eventually, yes, but not necessarily, for all parts of the world. Um, I will also from time to time point at differences within Europe because it's not the same thing everywhere. Um, and I will at some point during the lecture also try to theorize that and to argue that this challenges um, famous notions of organizational isomorphism. Um, think of DiMaggio and Powell's um, modern classic um, about the Iron Cage Revisited. Um, so it is, I think, important on the one hand to come to some conceptual generalizations, while we cannot always make empirical generalizations. Okay, um, having said that, universities as special organizations. So for quite a while, and you could say, roughly speaking, until the age, 1980s, maybe even 1990s, um, organizational sociology um, was inspired by studies of the university as an organization, 
that developed very influential conceptual thinking about universities being special. Universities not being like any other organization and certainly not being like a company, like a firm, like a corporate actor, if you like. And I just have listed four of them here. Organized anarchies, uh, the collegial organization, universities as loosely coupled systems, characterized by garbage can decision processes. This is in a way all very much institutional theory inspired and it is really the old institutionalism, um, not yet the new institutionalism um, that <clears throat> has provided the conceptual foundations for this kind of thinking. And in a sense, you could say all of this is saying, well, is this actually an organization? To what extent does the organization have actorhood? Question mark, internally and externally. Um, to what extent is the organization actually in charge, responsible? Um, for what is happening within the organization, or isn't the organization rather an arena than an actor? An arena in which academics and others, students, support and service staff, some kind of administration, are acting, yes, but it is not really the organization as such that is acting. And I don't want for the sake of time now to go through into all of these different concepts, um, but they characterize modern classics in organizational sociology, pointing at peculiarities of universities as organizations, because that they are what we call formal organizations, never was a doubt. But they are in many ways, not really organizations as any others. So having said that, we see since the 90s in Europe, um, changes in the discourse, most namely the political discourse about universities. We see political dissatisfaction with this um, way of universities being as organizations. And that has led, among other things, there are other factors as well, um, to quite some, and you could say, depending on in which part of Europe or the world, for that matter, you are ongoing socio-political struggle about the institutional form of the university, including redefinitions of its socioeconomic role, changes in their regulation and funding, and a process of what you could perhaps call business inspired organizational practices into higher education. And somehow in this process, universities are becoming more like other organizations. There may be limits to that. We can discuss that. Um, but we can see that these traditional characteristics of universities are not 
written in stone, that they are socially constructed. And what is socially constructed can also be socially reconstructed, of course. And I try to capture that by headlining it as universities becoming a focus, foci, in the coordination of the field. And what implies that traditionally they were not foci in the coordination of the field. And why is that? For Europe, at least, I would argue it has a lot to do with wider processes of the redefinition of the role of the state. And what position the state, the government, if you like, takes vis-a-vis -vis universities. All having to do with issues around expectations about the role, about the performance of universities, about regulation and funding, and the rest of it. And that made universities as in Europe, traditionally being public services embedded in wider reforms of public sectors. So what has happened has not just happened in higher education. It has not just happened to universities. And in higher education research, we sometimes forget that, that um, this was a much wider um, sociopolitical and economic process actually, that included processes of privatization, of changing regulation, of changing funding, of changing the ways in which organizations previously known as public sector providers would be run by the state. And this and part of parcel, part and parcel of this process was that governments transferred responsibility to universities as organizations. And while the political rhetoric used to stress this, we giving you universities more responsibility, we let go to some extent, we let you go to some extent, it's also a process of transferring risk to universities. Because once you get responsible for what you do as an organization, you are also in charge of taking the risk of what you are doing, implying that if things go wrong, for specific universities as well as in the wider population of universities, um, it is universities who will be blamed. So part of this whole making universities foci in the coordination of the field has also something to do with blame avoidance on the part of the governments in some cases, in some countries, this goes as far as if we have problems on the labor market um, as regards employability of graduates, it's of course the universities who got it wrong. Um, so this was a perspective from the state's point of view. At the same time, we have observed to some extent processes that have been coined as the marketization 
of higher education. And markets need actors. They need consumers. This is captured by notions of students being customers. But they also need producers. And this is the university as an organization. It is not academic communities. It is not a department. It is the university as an organization. So thinking around marketization of higher education has also fueled, if you like, uh, changes as regards expectations for the role of the university as an organization. And last but not least, the commensuration of organizational performance. I mean, we live in a world of rankings, don't we? Um, and many there are these days. And the most influential rankings are those who suggest that they measure and rank the performance of universities. What a strange thing to do. Universities are very mm, multifaceted organizations with many very different units of performance within the university. And somehow we think that this can be aggregated to the performance of a university. So doing that also gives an input into, into thinking and practices that the university as an organization is important. My university has recently become the Times, the newspaper, London-based newspaper, Times University of the Year. So I'm now talking to you from the University of the Year. Strange thinking that is, if you think about it, I would argue. So all of this, from my point of view, is contributing to a thinking that, and to practices, not just thinking, that stimulate a process, a transformation, in which universities become more corporate actors. And be aware, corporate here does not mean business. It means that a social entity, in this case, the university as an organization, becomes an actor and is expected to take responsibility and risk, among other things. So having said that, um, I would like now to move on into well, if this is the background of the story, what can we do and what can we say when we do organizational studies in higher education that are addressing these issues of the transformation of the organizational form of the university? So in the first case, I want to point at a publication that I did with my colleagues Eva Bleikli and Benedetto Lepori in the journal Organization Studies, um, where basically you could say we picked up um, a paper by Niels Brunsen and um, Kerstin Salin Andersen from Sweden and Norway to um, outstanding organization scholars who had argued that we can understand public sector 
organizational transformation by looking at hierarchy, rationality, and identity of these public service organizations. Um, it was quite an influential paper and we kind of developed that further. Um, and by, on the one hand, providing definitions, what Brunson and Sarlin and Andersen did not do, of what do we actually mean by hierarchy, rationality and identity, and by operationalizing these concepts for empirical observation. So what do we mean? Hierarchy. This is of course this idea of an organization being a pyramid and having a steep hierarchy, a flat hierarchy, but having something like a top and a bottom having one layer in between, having many layers in between, but in any case, to have something like leadership and management that is coordinating the action in this collective entity. And that tries to bring organizational members, especially, but not necessarily only, staff of the organization, together to engage in a common project. So hierarchy is a means, if you like, of organizing an organization in a specific way. It's not the only way to organize organizations, but it's one very prominent way. Um, and this goes kind of back to a very classical text by Uchi, who has had developed a very influential typology of different organizational forms. So we wanted to look at hierarchy. We also wanted to look at rationality. And rationality is a word, a concept, that is used in quite different ways. So one, it's a bit slippery. One has to be a bit careful with it. What we, the, the use we made is really a classical Weberian, Max Weber way of thinking. Um, that was part of what he was writing about 100 years ago now, when he wrote the Iron Cage the um, organization as an iron cage. So rationality understood as a means goals relationship to achieve organizational effectiveness and efficiency. It's about the organization being intentional it's about the organization having objectives and preferences. The organization internally allocating responsibility and also internally measuring results and performances. So it's means goals in acting this and monitoring this. This is what rationality means in this case. Our concept for this specific research of rationality. And last but not least, identity, organizational identity. Um, that is something that is socially constructed in our understanding, it is not just there. It is socially constructed in interaction, by the way, between the organization and its environment. It emphasizes the symbolic and cognitive side of organizations. Um, 
and their role in developing a sense of self. And that could also imply a sense of future self. What we would like to become, what we would like to be, both what we are and what we would like to be. So we took this uh, from one paper that I uh, wrote with um, my then Dutch colleagues, Harry de Boer and Ludwika Lajite, and we used it for a quantitative paper that was then published in Public Administration Review, if I remember that correctly. And we had a sample of, I think, something like 25 European universities. We did a survey among um, top and middle management leadership um, of these um, universities um, and constructed um, variables measuring, if you like, hierarchy, rationality, and identity as perceived and expressed in the survey by the organizational members themselves. So we broke that down into these, these very complex dimensions like hierarchy into these sub dimensions, if you like. To what extent do we see central coordination and control in a given university? The allocation of responsibility, the construction of management. To what extent are objectives set and by whom and results measured? Is, can we talk about an organizational self in the sense of the organization can control its boundaries? And I could talk about what that means perhaps a bit later, that it can control its resources and that it has a sense of being special as a university. Um, and this is all from a European point of view. Everything you see now on this PowerPoint has traditionally been either absent or unusual within universities. And I could explicate that and I could exemplify that um, in many ways. So that what we were looking at was something where we thought, well, this is, we're not quite sure to what extent we will find that. Uh, we're not quite sure to what extent this has already um, penetrated universities um, in Europe. Um, and on the next slide, I give you just a rough overview so the first empirical observation was there was a low level of organizational identity. Apart from really quite specialized universities, think about um, technical universities, for example. Universities did not really have an idea of being special. Their identities were what organizational scholars would call field identity. We are a university. Yeah. Um, and increasingly so, we are a very good university. So kind of self-promotion, marketing, um, a bit of 
self-grandeur, if you like, um, but not really an idea of being special as an organization. We found quite some expressions of the construction of hierarchy and rationality. And kind of unsurprisingly, these being empirically strongly associated with each other. And when testing this empirically, strongly correlated with new public management type of political environments for the modernization of universities. So universities within different countries were to some extent still different from each other. We could not find a situation where we would say, well, national characteristics, traditions, cultures don't play a role anymore. They still played a role. So that we found um, low levels of hierarchy and rationality in countries like Italy and France, in most of the German and Swiss universities. Um, while um, in other countries, we found more expression of hierarchy, the social construction of hierarchy and rationality. That was in Norway, that was in Portugal, that was certainly in the United Kingdom and the Netherlands. And the United Kingdom is a very well-known front runner, early adopter of policies inspired by neoliberal thinking for universities, inspired by economically grounded organizational theories such as principal agency theory, public choice theory, um, that stimulated political action in these countries vis-a-vis -vis their universities. So this is kind of an empirical exemplification of what I said earlier about new public management, the strengths and timing of new public management inspired um, political action coming into play when we see where universities stand as regards hierarchy and rationality. And then we moved on to a related but different topic, organizational control in universities. So there is obviously kind of an overlap to the to both, to organizational hierarchy and to organizational rationality. And being able to control the behavior of organizational members to achieve coordination and alignment with organizational goals is in organizational theory one of the prime motives why we have organizations at all. This is in a sense, again, classical Weberian thinking about the bureaucracy as the prime and very or more effective and efficient way of organizing things in society. So to what extent can we see that leadership and management um, is actually able to control the organization? 
and we ask two research questions. Do we observe differences in how organizational control is achieved um, between the universities that we took as our case studies for this qualitative research? So we looked especially at, is control attempted to be achieved in a hierarchical way? So top down, in an extreme case, you may think about command and control. But there's also another way that is negotiation, that is networking and negotiation within the university as an organization to achieve some degree of top down control. Is it rule based? So really formal rules that run through the organization, or is it informal? Or you could also say informal rule based. And importantly, again, this seems to be a running theme in this strand of research of mine. We, look, we took the environment of universities into account. And we ask ourselves if, if actually the patterns of organizational control within the university has something to do with the characteristics of the university's environment. So the institutional environment, the rules, values, norms predominant within the environment, the resource dependencies of universities, their resource environment, but also, again, the network relationships that seem to be characteristic for the position of a given university within its environment. And we did something quite unusual, actually. We did what I would call autoethnographic studies of our own universities. And obviously, we uh, anonymized them, and we called the three universities Central, Northwest, and South. And what we found was that in all three of them, leadership management control had meanwhile become common. There, none of these three case study universities could have been characterized by a traditional concept of being loosely coupled anymore. They were all more tightly coupled. At the same time, there was, in all three cases, a relative absence of the overt use of power, of command and control, if you like, um, that was um, sometimes to the frustration of leadership and management within the organization that would have liked to be more powerful, to be more coercive, to be more in command of the organization. And beyond these commonalities, we found three very different stories. So in one university, I have coined that here, depersonalized managerialism. What does that actually mean? It means that the university exercise control by performance targets, performance measurements, and related financial incentives. 
the, the university had developed a whole machinery of governing by numbers that apparently nobody was in charge of. It was, it seemed as if this governance by numbers was an actor in itself, but a depersonalized actor. In the second university, Northwest, we found something like formalized leadership control mixed up with core decision making. So a mix between top down leadership and negotiation and joint decision making with academics. So kind of a mix between a more managerialist approach and the old idea of the university being a collegial organization to some extent at least still run by its academic bodies. And in the third university south, um, we found tight control through informal instruments. Um, somebody once, once said, well, this university is run by a benevolent dictator. What is a very specific type of exercising top-down control within the university and every other um, organizational context, actually. And these commonalities and differences um, inspired us um, to try to work this out in the concept of penetrated hierarchies that brings together the control model within the organization, you would see that in the right bottom box, control model within the organization with environmental characteristics that are penetrating the organization. I'm not trying to talk you through now this whole um, a figure um, that might be a bit too long and too complicated, but I want to point at some basic ideas. The starting point is neo-institutionalist, global institutional templates that is at the right top of the figure. So it really reflects this idea of the new institutional school, uh, school in Stanford of um, John Mayer, of Rudy Powell, of um, Chiki Ramirez and others um, that um, we see the diffusion the global diffusion of institutional templates that unfold coercive pressures onto organization that in essence then become lookalikes. However, we argue that this is moderated on the one hand by the state and public policies. So this is the top box to the left. Um, that creates a certain resource environment for organizations. This also influences the strength and coerciveness of the institutional pressure unfolded by these institutional templates that then sink into the organization where they again get moderated and adopted. 
So yes, we agree that there is something like um, a role of ideas, of rules, norms, values within the institutional environment of the organization that does, however, not necessarily lead to joint patterns of change and joint patterns of control models within the organization. That is, in a nutshell, kind of the theoretical argument that we made um, in this paper. That again um, stresses some commonalities, but also some variation. So what brings me again to a related but different topic, and that is the last story I, I want to share with you before I round it up. Um, what is actually the time? Oh, sorry. Okay. Sorry for that. Oops. Oh. Stop share. Where is it? Ah, there. Okay. Yeah, and do that. Okay, so I make this brief now for the sake of time. I don't know how it is in your country, but across Europe, there was for quite a while a lot of talk about making universities more autonomous. And um, governments stepping back from steering and controlling the universities. Um, and that had led to an idea that universities would have more freedom from the government. Um, and in another paper, um, we looked at that issue. And we argued that there is a miss of autonomy. And that actually organizational autonomy in itself is used as a tool of a new regime of governmental control. We say it's not true that governments have stepped back. It's not true that universities have more freedom in general. It's actually government's thinking that delegating responsibility and risk to universities may be a means of being more capable of controlling them. So universities working in the shadow of hierarchy, facing more and more organizational account accountability requirements, being stressed on procedural autonomy and managerial capabilities, governments steering organizational choices by incentives and disincentives, and bonding them in performance contracts. These are some expressions, if you like, of what we then coined as regulatory autonomy. So using autonomy as a means of regulating universities. So I think it is time now to stop for me, isn't it? because we still want to have time to discuss. So I stop sharing here. What? Oh yeah. Well, you have stopped, you should have stopped me earlier. 
<laughs> uh, it's about 15 minutes, so it's okay. Thank you very much for uh, this very uh, thorough uh, introduction to this idea of universities um, as a as an organization, especially, I mean, through the discussion, you give a lot of examples using the Euro European universities as a, mm -hmm. as a uh, case studies to to introduce all these ideas about uh, uh, constructing hierarchy, rationality, and identities, and also how this these ideas actually. Uh, link to the link to the changes in the university governance, uh, internal and external, especially regarding universities' position in the in the market, and also including the university interaction with a wider environment. Uh, in the past couple of years, I think the uh, the very interesting part is this idea of uh, uh, organization the the, the, universe, the the organizational control. Uh, because this idea really linked to, as you uh, discussed in the, the, the very uh, last uh, page of your presentation, of regulatory autonomy, because our previous speakers also touched upon this idea of this new NPM reform and how this actually um, creating this imaginary university have more freedom, but actually mm -hmm. was <laughs> kind of put up, put into uh, you know, this accountability kind of uh, uh, trap where, um, you know, the actual space of discretionary power of university was quite limited. And also, I think you you also uh, mentioned, you know, um, your discussion about European universities may be uh, quite different from what happens uh, in, in other parts of the world. So I think the uh, mm. participants today, maybe they, they can offer their case studies from their experiences and how their observation might be uh, similar or dissimilar to your observations mm -hmm. of the European universities in the past 20 or 25 years. So um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Anders, for this wonderful presentation. So now maybe we just open the floor uh, for questions. And uh, please, uh, if anyone wants to raise a question, please uh, open your microphone and uh, introduce yourself and then, and then just raise your question. Uh, otherwise, uh, you can also uh, type your question in the in the chat box. Uh, any uh, questions uh, so far? Uh, all right. So if there uh, if people still can 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 considering their questions, uh, I want to uh, ask a, a question and uh, take the privilege of being the host. So Professor okay. Anders. Um, I, I think you started your presentation with a reference to this classical paper by uh, uh, Bruce and Shalene Anderson talking about the uh, constructing organization using the public sector reform as, a, as an example. I think that that was actually, I mean, this kind of theoretical framework uh, using the uh, hierarchy, rationality, and also the identity as a framework to analyze whether or not the organization was actually transforming to a more complete organization. Uh, so I guess my question is, um, uh, because you know, in, in a couple of your publications also debate the idea whether the university has already become a more complete organization or become already become a complete organization. So my question is, um, if the university was transforming towards becoming a more uh, complete uh, organization. That's our previous conceptualization of university as a special, special organization, as a you know loosely coupled uh, with organizational anarchy, mm -hmm. and that's all this traditional description of university st still holding true, or they change, uh, or they are still there, but the, the degree of you know th this kind of characteristic is. It's not as explicit as before. <laughs> right. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, I I think this is an empirical question, right? You know, which universities are you looking at? With in which context? Um, where do they come from? Um, so I could, for example, now say, well. Did the concept of loose coupling ever apply to Chinese universities? Question mark. Would, do we take that for granted? I don't know. But let's, you know, 
So, and what I was trying to say is, I think we see, at least in Europe, um, we have clear indications of change. And I think it is ongoing change. It is not revolutionary change, but evolutionary change. And it moves into a certain direction um, that is of a more, the university as a more complete organization. But depending on the country and the type of university, this process is more, ad more or less advanced. It's not the same in Germany as in England. It's not even the same in Scotland as in England, for example. And there are good reasons for that. Um, making again a point about, let's not forget about the wider institutional environment of universities. Um, and what probably means that we are currently, I would agree with that, in a situation where we would characterize most universities as hybrids, kind of a mm, precarious and fragile coexistence between the old and the new. Um, while I think the train is still moving into um, becoming modern. This is a fascinating word, modern. We all want to be modern, don't we? Um, we just don't know what it is and if it's actually really good for us. Um, no, the same holds for modernization policies. Um, I hope that this was gave at least some response to your question, Paul. Thank you very much. I guess uh, my question is really about, you know, has the global institutional uh, templates for university has changed? <laughs> you know, because you mentioned all these macro level changes, right? Like the role of the state, uh, like, you know, all this kind of transformation, not only in higher education, but in also other social sectors or public sectors. So has, because of this kind of global change, has the the, the global institutional uh, template for university changed. And then yes. different countries just have different kinds of, uh, you know, realization. <laughs> yes, um, I would say so. And I think we have enough empirical evidence for that. Um, and we have enough empirical evidence that this has diffused as um, uh, political scientists would call it, has diffused really across the globe. Um, there is a certain discourse, and that's important, a discourse that has become hegemonic, that portrays universities in different ways than it used to be 30 or 40 years ago. And that thinks that it is a good idea um, to make universities more corporate actors. Um, and that we all would benefit from that, obviously, that would always be the promise. Um, the university in the knowledge society, the university in the knowledge economy, as if society and the economy ever functioned without knowledge, but that's again a very different um, issue. Um, yes, I would say the global institutional template has changed. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much because you know all this new phenomena you observe in the European universities. Uh, I think it also to some degree also happens in China. Mm -hmm. uh, especially, you know, this trend of university become more like a corporate uh, uh, actor. 
uh, I think we, we can see everywhere here because in the very beginning, you mentioned the global ranking, right? The University of Bath was mm -hmm. the Times, the University of the Year. I think that's also, you know, kind of, uh, how do you say, uh, uh, strong social uh, expectations, right? Of what the university should be. So, you know, once the University of Bath become the University of the Year, I think it become also the role model, many of the university, if they want to try to be successful, so they were looking uh, looking to mm -hmm. this kind of a new image, right, of universities, mm -hmm. and that will, you know, maybe later on change their own ident identities because they want to become more uh, similar to the successful ones. And I think that in, in that in that sense, um, many university will be changed uh, their own kind of. Uh, um, uh, hierarchy and and you know also the identities and oh yeah in 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 a way to become more uh, to be to become to survive or become more successful right mm -hmm. yeah I mean what what you just said is following the leaders mm. mimetic isomorphism um, and that but that also also only works to some extent. Um, and um, and behind that, maybe that got a bit lost in my too long presentation. Um, there's really also something that these all these rankings and ratings they stimulate everybody to think about the university as an organization. Um, and that's in a sense very strange because at least from a research point of view, the primary locus of production of knowledge is not the university. It's the scientific communities. And they are networks across universities. And from their point of view, from an academic point of view, the university gives me a more or less good organizational platform to develop my contribution within the scientific community. Uh, uh, because and there's a question in the chat box uh, by Professor Yan Feng Chia to the, the colleague from my university. Professor Yan, would you like to open your microphone and raise your question yourself, please? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Anders. It's a very uh, interesting, interesting lecture for us to understand Europe uh, universities. The term penetrating hierarchy, uh, in my uh, opinion, is an effective term to come by close and open theoretical perspectives. Could you elaborate what are emphasis of this open perspective, technical environment, or institutional environment are penetrating more into Europe universities? Mm. I'm, I hope I understand your question correctly. So um, I think various things are happening. Um, as I have argued, I think governments have actually increased their influence on universities. Um, they have also changed the funding regime for universities. They have also opened up universities to new expectations as regards their contribution to society and economy. Um, and they have 
indirectly contributed in some cases to changes of universities acting more like a business. So I don't know how it is in your university. My university has a marketing department. It does branding. It publishes its ranking results and other success stories. Um, it has um, an office that scans opportunities for research grants. And I could go on like that. So you can see how the university is doing things that it traditionally would not do. The idea that a university would do self-marketing would 30 years ago have been found ridiculous, if I may put it that strong. And nowadays, it's just taken for granted. It's normalized activity within the university. Um, so I think these are all examples of how things can change um, and how the environment of the university has changed. Um, yeah, I leave it like that. More could be said. Yeah. Your uh, presentation, you mentioned uh, Italy and the French are uh, low modernization. Could you uh, explain why you see that? Why I see that? Um, so first of all, it's um, a well-known also in the uh, political science and public administration literature that certain countries in Europe have been latecomers and slow movers when it comes to neoliberal inspired policies, when it comes to new public management. We read so much about this, but if you look at it, it is mostly written by people from Britain, from Australia, from the Netherlands, from Scandinavian countries, partly because that had become quite an important social reality within these countries, but less so in others, like for example, France and Southern European countries. Germany, my own um, home country, would be another example for that. So this is an empirical observation. Um, and it also applies to the government's take vis-a-vis -vis universities. Um, what does not mean that these countries are not changing, but they are changing more slowly, more reluctantly, um, less deep. I mean, I don't know if you can follow that in the media, but look, for example, at the current situation in France around retirement age. That I think exemplifies quite well what I'm talking about. Now the question is, why is that? And that's actually a different one. Um, the easy answer would be, well, it is welfare state capitalist countries that are more reluctant to buy into the neoliberal agenda. But that's only partly true because the Scandinavian countries have traditionally been, and to some extent still are very much welfare state countries. So there must also be other cultural elements um, why the state and society both are reluctant to quickly, fast, and deeply buy into such a modernization. 
a genog. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Anders, there's another question but from Elizabeth. So Elizabeth, would you like to open your microphone, introduce yourself and raise your question, please? Uh, yes. <clears throat> My name is Elizabeth Balbashevsky. I am from Brazil. Uh, Brazil is a very, experience a very different situation because here we have some autonomous university, but without contract. <clears throat> with without any kind of the old way. Mm -hmm. More or less seem seeing. We have witnessed some changes that come from the science foundations. You know, because mm -hmm. science is became more. <clears throat> more complex we have new designs asking for for the university to step an important role in supporting the the whole thing about about, about research and also uh, in disseminating the research outputs mm -hmm. and these are changing a lot inside the university so i would say <clears throat> Would you think that <clears throat> maybe the change in the way society sees the university and the way science is, is funding is another uh, path for changing the university? Mm -hmm. um, I could only partly understand what you were saying, Elizabeth, but I think I got the the gist of it. So this is moving us, what I find very interesting, into the world of science policy. And as higher education researchers, we sometimes forget about that. Um, that universities are targets of higher education policy, of science policy, and innovation policy. And I think what you said points to me into a direction that you can also see internationally. That science policy and science funding is also moving into a direction where the regulatory and funding environment of universities is changing. Um, into a direction where science is expected to become more relevant, more impactful, um, more practical, if you like, where attempts are made to steer the problem choice of scientists according to political priorities by providing funding um, allocated for certain topical areas, for example, where scientists are invited to engage more with their other stakeholders, the public, if you like. So I could go on like that. And I think this also opens the doors for a changing role of universities vis-a-vis -vis their scientists. Um, but I think it is still more contested because for, I would say, understandable reasons, it is much, it is easier to exercise organizational control vis-a-vis -vis teaching and learning than vis-a-vis -vis research and science. But definitely something is happening in this space as well. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Professor Anders. There's another question from the chat box from uh, Yu Meng. Uh, so would you please open your microphone and raise your question? Thank you. Hi, this is 
Then, yes, thank you very much for your in, um, inspiring um, presentation. I have a really like basic and empirical question about university governance. For me, um, I'm doing research about university governance, like from the perspective of personnel matters. Um, but when I'm reading your papers and also your like I listen to, to your presentation, I found that. Um, when we are talking about university governance, most of us are talking about the administration or the governance in general, but not the specific matters such as research, teaching, and personnel matters like this. So I'm wondering, um, is it like is it better or is it a better way to focus on a more specific matter to understand governance in a more specific way? Um, or or if multi, multiple task is involved when we are doing research in this area, how can we like make generous generalizations or comparisons among such like complex tasks within universities? Thank you. Mm. Um, very good question, very interesting. Um, I I give you my personal take on this. Um, I think both is valuable and interesting to take a more generic, comprehensive, if you like, perspective, but also to take a more um, function-specific perspective. Like you said, for example, human resource management. Um, no? And sometimes taking this more specific perspective can actually inspire our more generic thinking about the university. Um, that will not always be the case, but sometimes it will be the case because um, the management of specific functions of organizations is sometimes changing how can I say, into the same direction, guided by the same ideas, by the same overall goals within the organization. Uh, but that is an empirical question that perhaps, you know, your research can um, highlight and give us more insight in. Um, but then you kind of had a sub-question that was about generalizations and comparisons. Um, and I mean, my response to that would be a rather classical social scientist response, meaning um, our empirical work usually, not always, but usually, does not allow us to make strong empirical generalizations. You know, when you are studying three universities and their human resource management, you cannot afterwards say, well, all universities are like that, right? Yeah. It's just yeah. simply impossible. But what you can say is, my research inspires me to make some conceptual generalizations. Mm -hmm. um, and that is very important and a very much welcome contribution that then goes beyond your specific cases and your specific situation that you are investigating and can be very inspirational and useful for other researchers as well. Yes, yes. thank you, thank you. <laughs> Pleasure. Uh, thank you for the question and wonderful response. Is there any other questions from the audience? Uh, please feel free to just uh, open your microphone and, and ask questions. Uh, uh, okay, if there are no more questions uh, for Professor Anders, uh, probably we just uh, come to the end of our uh, lecture today. Uh, yeah, so today uh, we have, we're have we honored to have a Professor Anders here to give us an interesting uh, uh, presentation. 
on the uh, on the university's um, uh, changes, especially towards the complete organizations, and also give a lot of examples, uh, cross country comparison cases of the European universities and how you know all these universities under under undergone uh, organizational changes in the past couple of years, especially given this kind of uh, new regulatory environment uh, in the European countries. Uh, also, uh, there have been a couple of questions from different country backgrounds uh, from the audience about, you know, different issues regarding uh, science policy, university changes, and also, you know, the more general trend uh, in different countries. So I think this is a very nice and uh, interactive uh, session we have today. Uh, so as a, uh, so we thank you very much, Professor Jurgen uh, Anders, for your, uh, for your wonderful uh, input, especially regarding, you know, nicely uh, lay out um, your research in the past 20 years <laughs> and give us this very nice uh, 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 overview of the, um, uh, your past research. Um, so, um, uh, Yulia already posted our next uh, lecture will uh, come in in April 18th. Uh, so our speaker will be Professor Tsai Yuzhuo, who is also the co-host of this lecture series. So please uh, do join us uh, in three weeks and, and we will have another interesting session about the uh, uh, institutional perspective on university uh, uh, governance. So, uh, so thank you all the participants for, for your time and also sharing your experiences and also uh, we're looking forward to meeting you in the next lecture. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thank you.